If you would be turning your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, you have your Bible with you, hold it up really high. You have your cell phone where your Bible is, hold it up high. Whenever Aaron was reading his scripture reading this morning from his phone, I've had the overwhelming urge. I am so glad I did not have my phone. I would have called him. I just think it would be fun. Somebody's reading from the scripture. Obviously, their phone is on. Or text. <laughs> Beep. Oh, hold on. Somebody just texted me. <laughs> oh, it's a Facebook like. Good. <laughs> but I did. I, I thought, wouldn't it be kind of cool if I called you while you're reading scripture and you said, hello, God? Did I not pronounce that right? What should I say? Because you see, the name of God is used in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. We have the title God, Elohim, is used in verse 1. We're introduced to the main character of this book, the author of this book, in the first verse of this book. And the book says, in the beginning... God, and the word there is Elohim. If you know a little bit about Hebrew, and if you don't know anything about Hebrew, but you know something about this word, you understand that this word is a plural word of the Hebrew word El, E-L. Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M, is plural for El. El is singular. That would be God. Elohim would be plural. That would be God's. In the beginning, God's created the heavens and the earth. And yet we know that there's only one God, for God himself said, I'm only one. There are not more than one of me. I'm the only one. I am the one and only. I am El, God. And yet he's called Elohim. What's going on here? Hmm, I raise the question now. Perhaps we'll see the answer later. But God himself is writing his book through Moses 1,500 years before Christ, about 35, 3,600 years ago, he wrote these words, in the beginning, Elohim created. He created the heavens and the earth. The earth, now we're focused on where we are. The heavens and the earth, what does it look like when God created out of nothing, everything? What did that look like? I have a feeling it looks something like this. Now, for those of you who are looking down writing, trying to fill in the blanks, that I have not given you an answer yet. It, for those of you who are looking down, it looked like this. It started here, exploded outward. God created. And it could be a big bang. I'm not opposed to that, because you see, that would also explain why things that are close to each other at the very beginning and travel distant away, why the light would not have to be from there traveling to here, but always has been connected. So though they are light years apart because of the travel from the <laughs> initial creation, light has always been connected between the planets. And so from the earth, we would have been able to see the light if God hadn't encompassed the earth with something that would veil that. Hmm. Just an idea. Throw it out for your chewing. But the creation of verse 1 and the statement of verse 2, we have no clue the time distance between the two. I just want to postulate that for you to let you also chew on, ruminate, bring that back up to your mind over and over. Think about it. verse 1 and verse 2 could be millions of years apart. We just don't know. But verse 2 says something about the earth. What was the earth? Well, the earth was without form and was void. What does that mean? Absolute total chaos without form. So what did God do with the without form earth? Well, God hovered over the earth. Spirit of God hovered over the earth that was without form or void. What do you suppose God is now doing with the chaos called earth? I would suggest he's formulating some things. How long did that take? Well, quite honestly, it would take an instant for him just to speak it. Or eons, we don't know. Time, perhaps, has yet to even exist. I don't know. Just throwing that out as well. This is pre-anyone ever being there to observe it all. Writing. I have to think 
that there's more to this than what we're able to read and comprehend because we weren't there. Now, God said, God said, God said, God said, God said, God said. said. Elohim, 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 Elohim. Each of those passages, as you read through chapter 1, God said, and then God said, verse 26, after creating, separating the waters from the lands, after bringing from the land uh, plant life and out of the waters teams of these sea animals and up in the air birds and, and, and on the land we have animals growing and we have, we have man created, verse 26. And here's the order, God said. After each time God said and God did, what then did God say or God recognize? Evening and morning, first day, and it was what? It was good, 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 it was good. good. And then he says, verse 26, let us make man, and Elohim, plural, said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and um, let them, oh, wait a minute, I thought man, let us make man, and let them, okay, keep green. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the livestock of the, and over the, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. I like that poetic device that Moses is utilizing here to wrap this thing up. And then he says, male and female, he created them. The them there is the man here. Man represents both. The term man. Don't get hung up on a, well, God is calling he, and aren't we a she? Yeah, you are. That's cool. But together, we are the image of God. And separately, by the way, men and women created in the image of God, both rulers over the world, dominion over the fish and the animals and the birds and the creeping things and over all of the earth. We are we are. We are to the world what God is to the universe. God placed us as little hymns, H-I-M-S. Little hymns in a sense, not that we're gods, but that we're sort of God over this world in that we're rulers. And what else are we? We're creators, aren't we? We're created in His image. God, God, by the way, has free will. And He created us with, in His likeness after His image, we have Free will. But wait a minute, I thought if God is Lord, didn't he have sovereign will? Ah, Good question. File that away. We'll deal with that too. And so we have jumping ahead in chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens, plural, and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day. Don't take that to mean he was tired. Lean back and said, oh, oh boy, i got to rest now. That was a hard work because God never lost any power that he used to create. God himself is all power, and so he doesn't exert power. He expresses power. All right, so when God created, it wasn't he was resting because he was tired. It just simply means he stopped working on the seventh day. He he ceased from his labor. And what did he do? And so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens. I thought he did it in six days. And this says in the day. Hmm, maybe day doesn't always mean day. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant in the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God. Do you see something new there? Do you see something new? Look carefully at your Bible and notice this. Capital L, little capital O, little capital R, little capital D. Spelled out like that on your sheet, Lord. What is Lord? Well, Lord means, is translation of Yahweh. If you want to write this down, Y-H-W-H. 
the name of God. Jehovah is the German pronunciation of the Hebrew Yahweh. So Yahweh, which was an unpronounceable name, when the Jewish scribes reached the name of God, instead of writing Yahweh and pronouncing it, as I understand, they would bathe, they would put on special clothes, they would use a special pen with special ink, and they would write the tetragram Yahweh. And then quickly above it would write how to pronounce that because you couldn't say the holy name of God. So they wrote above it the Hebrew word Adonai. What is Adonai? (laughs) Guess what? Lord. Adonai means Lord. And so Yahweh, the name of God, became Lord in pronunciation in the reading of Scripture. The Lord God, literally, Yahweh Elohim created the man. Yahweh Elohim created the garden. Yahweh Elohim put the man to sleep. Yahweh Elohim. Why are we introduced to the name Yahweh? Which is translated every time you see capital L, little capital O, little capital R, little capital D in the Old Testament, recognize that's the name of God, Yahweh. Okay, why are we introduced to the name Yahweh? Well, the name Yahweh, which means Lord, the name of Yahweh, the Lord God created the what? Heavens and the earth. Or you may say the man and the woman. Or you may say the husband and the wife. Hmm, I think all three would fit there. And if you were to fill these out as a quiz and hand them in, I would count any of those three correct. For he did create the heavens and the earth. He did create the man and the woman. And he did create the husband and the wife. Point. Lord, why are we seeing the shift in chapter 2 from Elohim, which is referring to the creative, powerful God, to Lord Yahweh. Yahweh, I would suggest, is referring to the covenant aspect of God. And in the garden, he creates the lone ranger, Adam, and then he brings all of these animals two by two in front of him, and he has a chance to create them, or rather not create them, name them, right? So here comes the elephant. I just think the creativity of the day. This is so cool. Elephant. Elephant, Mr. and Mrs. Elephant, cow, horse, lion, we'll name that one Cecil, couldn't help it, Um, ostrich, (laughs) Lord, this is, this is cool, duck-billed platypus. By the end of the evening, he's got one of his best friends showing up with his bride, dog. And then, uh, cat. God says, wait a minute, I didn't make that. Uh, and <laughs> I got that from somebody else. I thought it was funny. Then, God, then Adam looked up at God, and, and God said, it's not What? It is good, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is very good. But what did he say is not good? Not good that the man should be alone. But you see, the man didn't know that. Was he really alone? No, God was with him. But he needed a companion. I know he needed a companion because that's what God said. It's not good man should be alone. So he created somebody from his side to walk by side with him, to rule together over the earth, dominion together over the earth. If I read Genesis 1 correctly and interpret Genesis 2 correctly. But in order to do this, he put him to sleep, took out of his side a rib, fashioned the woman, brought her to the man, and the man said, Whoa, man! And so we have Ishish was created from Ish. You weren't there. (laughs) All right, so God, Yahweh, 
the Creator loved the created. The Creator loved the Creator. The Creator owned the created. And in between, the Creator created the purpose of the created. If I were to do that in the order in which I intended, it would have been this. And had I had my PowerPoint uh, able to be shown today and put together in all but our technical, technological difficulty, I'd put it in the reverse. The first one is the creator owned or owns the creator, the created. The creator gives the meaning or purpose of the created. And the creator loves the created. So real quickly, I want to look at those three principles and we're done. I mean, as fast as I can. And we may not get all three of those. How about if we don't? How about if we look at the first one? The created does what? The creator owns the created. How do I know that's true? Well, look at the 50th Psalm. First of all, it's true logically. You create something, you own it. God patented the man and the woman. I know that's true because he put his patent mark on us. The belly button. (laughs) The 50th Psalm. The Mighty One. Do you, you, you have your Bibles or are you just going to trust me on this? You ought to be reading with me. The 50th Psalm is page 405. The, the, mighty, the mighty one, God, the Lord, in case you're mistaken who he's talking about, the mighty one, God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Oh, out of Zion, the, be- the perfection of beauty. God shines forth. Our God comes. He does not keep silence. He does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire. Around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge, Selah. Hear, O people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against you. And I am God, your God. Hear carefully what David is writing from the words of God to the mouth, to the ears of of his people, from the mouth of God to the ears of his people, I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifice do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or a goat from your folds. Why? God doesn't need your bull and your goat. God's not looking for your money. God's not looking for your sacrifice. What's he looking for? Hmm. For every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is what? Mine. They all belong to me. You think you're bringing me something that's not mine? You think... That's yours, and you're actually sacrificing that to me? You're just giving me what is already mine. I own that. By the way, I own you too, God says. Who created you? So if God, if God owns the beast of the field, does it also make sense that God's own, God owns the people of the earth? We're his. We are his creation. He owns us. Now, in that sense, but through the process of sin, we have sold ourselves short 
into slavery and separation from God. And that's why when Jesus died, he died on the cross as if he were us, for us, and paid the price. So he sought us and bought us. You are double owned. You are double owned. I don't know if you remember the one minute spot, and I've told you the story before, but a little boy had whittled a boat. He was very proud. I mean, he was very proud of his boat. And he took it down to the river, and he, and he put it in the river, and he was floating along. He had a stick, a long stick, and he was keeping it close, but the, the current took it away. And then he speedily went down the river. He ran as fast as he could, but he lost sight of the boat. He lost his prized possession. He made that boat. It was his boat, and he lost it. Three weeks, four weeks later, he's walking downtown, and he sees in the big window pane inside the shop, there's this boat with an, with an amount on it. It said $5. And he went in and says, hey, mister, that's my boat. And the man said, okay, well, if you want, it's $5. He said, but it's my boat. I made it. Look, it's got my initials on the back. And he told him where it would be, and the owner looked at it, and he said, yeah, it's got your initials, but it's mine now. He said, but I made the boat. It's my boat. He said, if you want that boat, young man, you'll have to pay me $5. All right. And he pulled out his pocket money and he said, one, two, three, four. And he breached in and got his change. And he said, 25, 50, 75, 85, 95 pennies, $5 here. And he took the boat and he walked to the door. And as he reached the door, The owner of the shop heard him say, now you're twice mine. First I made you, then I bought you. That's exactly what Jesus did. He made us, he made us like himself, he made us for himself, and he bought us. And oh, the price was so much. It was his life. He shed his blood, because you're worth that to him. You're, wor- you're worth more than five bucks to Jesus. You are worth his life. Some of you have never done this before. Others of you have. And if you have and you're like me, you need to do it periodically. Some of you have never said this before, and I want you to say this, because I want you to feel the ramification and the value That is in that statement. Are you ready? I want you to say, I am worth the life of Jesus. Nah, I want you to do it together. Together. One, two, three. I am worth the life of Jesus. Some of you haven't said it. I want you to say it and really think about what you're saying. Ready? I am worth the life of Jesus. Some of you still aren't. I'm not seeing your lips move. And I'd like to see it in your face. But there's a recognition of what this means. And sometimes it takes a good three times before I get it. Think about this a moment. You have that value. Stop putting yourself down. He owns you. You've been bought with a price. Now, Some of you have not accepted that yet to allow him to fully own you. You haven't transferred ownership yet voluntarily. And that's what he's looking for. Bought and sold. Sold and bought. That, he, he paid the price. Now you voluntarily say, I accept that price. And you allow him to purchase you. Not from Satan. You aren't, you don't, you're not owned by Satan. You didn't, you didn't sell yourself to Satan. You sold yourself to sin. And that's since you're controlled by Satan. But you need to voluntarily accept from him. Listen, the water's ready. You can be baptized today. Allow him to wash your sins away. Start the new walk with him. You can do that now. Transfer the ownership. You ready? I am worth the life of Jesus. One more time. I want you to think about what you're saying. Back, close your eyes just a moment and think about the words. Together. I am worth the life of Jesus. The majesty from on high gave it all up and broke into our world 
so that we would know how much we're worth to him and we would live a different life. So let's sing to the majesty. Let's all stand together.